we go. Wonderful. So, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, just like to say we will begin recording the uh, seminar now. Uh, this recording will be made available via the Gilbrea Center YouTube page uh, after the seminar. If you don't wish to be in the recording, please turn off your camera now and just use your audio. So welcome and thank you for attending the first seminar of the Gilbrea Annual Seminar Series. We're pleased to be co-sponsoring this seminar with the Department of Health, Aging and Society, their Has Talk series. Uh, this year, the Gilbrea seminars will be exploring the theme aging, inclusion and embodiment. And we're thrilled to have with us Dr. Pia Contos, uh, and who is going to present a, a seminar titled A Critical Exploration of Creativity and Dementia at the Intersection of Embodiment, Relationality and Citizenship. Um, we ask that you keep yourself on mute during the presentation to avoid background noises. Uh, Pierre will present for 50 minutes and we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions uh, for a question and answer session. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any time, which we will um, reread on your behalf during the Q&A. Or you can unmute yourself at the end and ask Dr. Contest directly during the Q&A session. If we go over time, uh, Pierre wanted you to know that she would be very happy to answer any missed questions via email uh, later on today. So, Pia is a senior scientist at the Kite Toronto Rehab Institute at the University Health Network. She's an associate professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on structural and relational vulnerability to stigma associated with dementia in the context of community-based and institutional care settings. It contributes to the development of theories, policies and practices that support ethical care relationships and the development and evaluation of arts-based initiatives to reduce stigma and improve the quality of dementia care. I've known Pia for now nearly 20 years and I even used to read her papers when I was in the UK in the late 90s. So when I came to, to, to Canada, I thought I was going to meet someone my age or much older, but it, she'd apparently been publishing even in her undergraduate years. So yes, <laughs> a long time I've known Pia and her scholarship. Uh, take it away, Pia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gavin, for that very kind introduction. Um, I, I would also like to thank Peter um, DeMaio from the Department of Health, Aging and Society, and also Alicia Clifford from the same department, and, and Equity Burke from the Gilbrea Center for Aging Studies for so kindly inviting me. Um, to be a part of this uh, seminar, seminar series. I'm really honored um, to be included in such a terrific, terrific lineup of speakers. And I would also like to thank Rebecca Hessels. I understand that she's managed the registration and the posters and everything uh, in the back end, which is so fundamental to the success of an event like this. So thank you. I am particularly excited um, by this year's chosen theme, Aging, Inclusion and Embodiment. Given my interests in embodiment and dementia, citizenship, human rights, and the arts. And my hope is that by the end of my presentation, critical links between these topics, as well as the uh, ethical links between these, uh, the ethical implications of these links, um, will all be clear. So before I launch into my presentation, I would like to add to what Gavin has described of my research that in all of my work, I'm motivated by a very deep concern about stigma surrounding dementia and how it promotes social exclusion, deprives people with dementia of their dignity and mitigates their participation in social life. This can have detrimental consequences for quality of life and quality of care and undermine the rights of people living with dementia. So I'm I am committed to critiquing this stigma and to fostering an alternative and more humanizing vision of care and support that promotes inclusion, relationality, creativity, and the possibility of growth for everyone living with dementia. So by way of background, I'd like to begin with some discussion about stigma associated with dementia, 
the dominant discourses that are contributing to this stigma and the links between stigma and discriminatory practices, particularly in how the arts are reduced to a therapeutic tool to manage um, challenging behaviors. I'll then introduce a, a relational model of citizenship that I'll argue has enormous potential to contribute to the theoretical and empirical rethinking of creativity in the context of dementia and to more fully supporting people to live well with dementia. I'll discuss findings from two research studies of mine to illustrate how the relational model of citizenship brings a new and critical dimension to understanding creativity of persons living with dementia, while also addressing broader issues of their inclusivity and the ethical imperative to fully support engagement with the arts through institutional policies, structures, and practices. So I'll conclude with some thoughts about the implications of, of this analysis for practice. The analysis that I'm presenting here is based on two publications, and I offer um, the citations for those here if you're interested in following up on them. Um, and so I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Elisa Grigorovich, who's a CIHR postdoctoral fellow that I supervise, whose work is focused on health equity, aging, and stigma in the context of institutional and home-based care, and Mr. Romeo Kolobong, who's a senior research associate who works with me in all of the projects that I do at KITE, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. So persons living with dementia are highly stigmatized in society. Stigma is a complex social process that's used to describe the stereotypes, prejudices, um, and discriminatory practices that are based on a socially discredited attribute, such as a diagnostic label like dementia. Stigma has multiple negative health and social consequences for both individuals living with dementia and their families. There's considerable evidence that receiving a dementia diagnos diagnosis confers a master status to the individual, whereby persons with dementia come to be defined solely through their disease and the stigma that it engenders. It thus allocates the person to a lower social status and results in their social dislocation and marginalization. Self-internalization of stigma associated with dementia has been linked to avoidance of social interactions, isolation, feelings of shame and inadequacy, depression, anxiety, and even suicide. Stigma is a barrier to help seeking and in instances where help is sought, stigmatizing attitudes of formal care providers can create obstacles to timely diagnosis and delay access to therapeutic treatment. Stigma also extends to family, what's been termed courtesy stigma, and has been linked to negative emotional outcomes like embarrassment, shame, fear, reduced help seeking, increased care stress, and social isolation. Stigma thus poses a significant barrier to the social inclusion of persons living with dementia and their family cares, and negatively affects their health, well being, and quality of life. There are two dominant and interrelated discourses on dementia that are contributing to misunderstandings and prejudice, which fuel the stigmatization and social exclusion of persons living with dementia and their families. The first of these is, is biomedicine. Within the acute cure model of biomedicine, the person living with dementia is reduced to his or her neuropathology and care practices are restricted to attending to what are perceived as disease-driven problematic behaviors and undesirable functions of the body, while neglecting other important aspects of well-being for persons living with dementia, like relationships and meaningful participation in activities. With the adoption of the biomedical model, a therapy culture has come to define dementia care, where persons living with dementia are subjected to multiple assessments by various professionals who populate a list of needs and functional deficits of persons with dementia in order to assign interventions, therapies, and modifications to meet the needs that are identified. Leisure activities such as gardening and music are used and valued primarily as non-pharmacological treatments or therapies to achieve a host of medicalized outcomes, most notably the control of misunderstood actions and expressions. So valued aspects of daily life become medicalized. 
The primary focus of therapeutic intervention is to manage challenging, challenging behaviors with mechanical, environmental, and or environmental chemical restraints. In Canada, long-term care homes are governed by provincial legislation, which attempts to standardize care and accountability and requires homes, their management and staff members to operationalize codes of conduct through institution-specific policies and practices. There's a statement in the Ontario Long-Term Care Act, which implies that restraint and force is acceptable if it's used to complete bodily physical care. This physical care is understood to override all other kinds of care at the risk of both the resident's emotional well-being and the relationship between resident and healthcare worker. Additionally, the growing risk aversion culture of long-term care has led to the production of organizational policies that result in the social exclusion and isolation of older adults living in long-term care homes from broader communities. Even before the pandemic, many long-term care homes in Ontario stopped all outings outside the home setting, citing that the risks of a resident becoming injured or lost are too high for the home to assume. It's also been argued that the very design features of residential long-term care homes are discriminatory because of how they segregate and confine people living with dementia to a restricted space that they're not free to leave. The language embedded within the biomedical model and what's used by formal care providers reflects a broader cultural imaginary or collective representation of persons with dementia as incapable of purposeful and meaningful communication and the pursuit of life enhancing relationships and activities. So this brings me to the second dominant discourse on dementia, dementia as tragedy. The assumption is that the neuropathology that's associated with dementia eradicates the essence of the person. This is evident in the metaphors and images in policy and popular culture that represent dementia as a funeral without end the loss of self, the zombie, and a living death. This discourse has its roots in the rise of the modern self in the 17th century and the socially constructed cerebral self or the cerebral subject. As Vidal has argued, this ideology of the self, the individualism characteristic of Western and Westernized societies, the supreme value given to the individual as autonomous agent, of choice and initiative, and the corresponding emphasis on interiority treats the brain as the organ responsible for the functions with which the self is identified. When the self is assumed loss or eroded, loss of agency and citizenship statutes ensues. In 2009, an advisor to the British government suggested that persons with dementia had the moral duty to die, especially because of wasting human and fiscal resources. The Alzheimer's Research United Kingdom and their social media campaign, Share the Orange, provides another powerful example of this tragedy discourse. The campaign includes a video created by the makers of the Wallace and Gromit stories. This is the British um, claymation comedy series and features the actor Christopher Eccleston. This televised campaign uses an image of a slowly disintegrating orange to illustrate how dementia, quote, physically attacks the brain until it strips away everything that is you, and then you die, end quote. It refers to dementia as a scourge, a cancer, an attacker, and destroyer of not only the brain, but the person. And at the end, the last section of the orange falls over, signaling death. The intent of this campaign is to raise money and to find a cure for dementia, and the strategy is to foster fear and loathing of dementia. Assumptions of loss of self dehumanize and demarcate the lives of people living with dementia as disposable and enable and legitimize discriminatory practices such as leaving residents in soiled diapers, being left for hours at a time without any meaningful engagement with others or having opportunity to pursue meaningful activities and restrictions on the freedom of individuals living with dementia that I noted earlier. Restraints of all kinds, physical, chemical, environmental, are an obvious example of such restrictions. 
But the reduction of the arts to a non-pharmacological treatment or therapy to achieve medicalized outcomes, most notably the management of misunderstood behaviors, is another example of restrictions on the freedom of individuals living with dementia that I wish to focus on here. Arts-based programs have been adopted in dementia care primarily as a non-pharmacological means to improve behavior, cognition, and emotional states. And while these clinical outcomes are most commonly reported when assessing the impact of arts engagement on persons living with dementia, other benefits of engaging in artistic activities have been identified, including empowerment, meaningful self-expression, and sociability. However, these are typically considered side benefits and not the primary reason for implementing arts programs. The instrumental use of the arts to generate social and behavioral changes has now become a cornerstone of dementia care. Dominant approaches to understanding creative engagement, particularly in music and dance in the context of life with dementia, have focused on cortical structures and neural substrates as the generative mechanism for such creativity. The implicit assumption is that creativity is based on cognitive abilities and processes, most notably a working cognitive memory. Understandings of creativity implicit in these accounts derive from a presumed dichotomy between mind and body and an inherent inferiority of bodily constituted knowledge. Thus the body as a source of agency has long largely been neglected in accounts of music and dance and creativity more generally. We argue that understanding creativity of persons living with dementia requires engagement with critical gerontology subfield of embodiment and dementia. We further argue that to ensure that creativity is supported beyond therapeutics requires engagement with the fields of citizenship and human rights, as these fields focus on social entitlements and state responsibility to support and acknowledge citizens' participation in their own everyday existence. Insights from all of these respective fields have been integrated into a model of relational citizenship. I developed this model with Dr. Um, Elisa Grigorovich, who I mentioned earlier, a human rights lawyer, Mr. Alexis Contos, who works for the Department of Justice in Ottawa, and sociologist Dr. Karen Lee Miller, who does policy work for the Ministry of Health in long-term care in Ontario. Person-centered and relationship-centered paradigms of care have undoubtedly been influential developments in the dementia field since the 1990s. While these paradigms of care importantly underscore the intrinsic value of persons living with dementia and the interdependent and reciprocal nature of caring relationships, there has been a recent turn to citizenship discourse to more fully account for issues of power differentials within the triadic care relationship and with the state. Citizenship is a legal status based on nationality that's conferred by a state at birth or through naturalization, which also confers specific rights and duties, including civil, political, and social rights. It's a status bestowed on those who are full members of a community and thus discussion of citizenship introduces political discourse um, in that participation or inclusion in society is inevitably shaped by power dynamics. As, proponent, as, as um, proponents of citizen, citizenship scholarship have argued, a citizenship perspective critically draws attention to power and in particular, the lack of power afforded to some citizens in relation to others. The importance of such a focus for the dementia field is that power has not been sufficiently treated in person-centered and relationship-centered care paradigms. Citizenship extends relationship-centered care by incorporating an individual's relations with others into the socio-political landscape, thereby addressing influences on and access to and experience with health and social care relation, uh, institutions. An active model of citizenship was initially adopted in the field of dementia, granting citizenship, citizenship rights to individuals with dementia who had previously been excluded from the broader service user movement because they were seen as antithetical to the notion of the proactive 
rational consumer of services. Campaigning activities repositioned individuals with mild dementia as citizen workers and the companionship of others with similar impairments. I'm sorry, this yielded social and psychological benefits associated with activism, self-advocacy, and the companionship of um, others with similar impairments. Nonetheless, this model of citizenship is premised on the ideological construct of self-cognizance, which deepens the social devaluation of those with more severe cognitive impairment who may not be able to make recognizable public contributions. There have been important developments in the sociological field that have effectively broadened what counts as citizenship, such as the passive model of citizenship that's concerned with people getting what they're entitled to or have a right to expect as an equal citizen without having to make a public contribution. With this corrective to the ethical principle of no rights without responsibilities, citizenship is defined not by degree of participation, but rather by the degree to which an individual's rights are recognized and upheld through care practices, policies, and institutions. Yet there is a concerning absence in these developments of attention to the body as a source of agency and body world relations. Without consideration of embodied intentionality, which in the context of severe and persisting cognitive impairment is the primary means of engagement, such approaches to citizenship fall short of being fully inclusive. This suggests the need for citizenship discourse to engage with critical insights of scholarship on dementia and embodiment. Building on embodied selfhood, the relational model of citizenship underscores that primordial and sociocultural dispositions of the body are sources of self-expression and relationality. This advances a notion of selfhood that considers both the pre-reflective intentionality of the body and its natural engagement with the world, as well as the ongoing socio-cultural relationship between the pre-reflective body and the world. And together, these theoretical bearings capture the pre-reflective capacity of the body to seize upon and transform the, perspe the, the perceptible into something meaningful. The body here is intentional in its capacity to perceive and experience. And this importantly challenges assumptions of loss of agency with dementia by treating the body as itself having creative and intentional capacity. Thus, even in the face of cognitive impairment, agency persists. In the encounter between the body and the social world, sociocultural dispositions do not suppress the body's power of natural expression but in fact constantly utilize the pre-reflective, practical, and implicit hold that indi individuals living with dementia have on their body and the relation between their body and the world. Although postures, gestures, and movements of the body disclose a socio-cultural particularity that's shaped by socialization associated with membership in a particular cultural and historical context, Sociocultural practices are always dependent upon a basic level of intentionality, impelling and sustaining sociocultural expressions at every moment. Embodied selfhood highlights our intrinsic corporeality of being in the world, which sustains and animates self-expression and which is always intertwined with a shared world. In this sense, embodied selfhood is inherently intercorporeal and thus relational. Intercorporeality captures the ways in which bodies are inter interconnected with one another through a pre-reflective intertwining of body schemas. It's what Merleau-Ponty describes as an intertwining of the life world through the flesh, which provides a formative and dynamic structure for human embodied existence. It's important to note that this shared corporeal existence with other beings does not diminish the significance of alterity. Indeed, intercorporeal understanding is never an, a perfect appropriation of others' experiences. In this sense, intercorporeality is simultaneously the foundational nature of carnal existence and the alterity and ambiguity of the possibilities that such existence affords. Given that embodied selfhood and relationality are fundamental to the human condition, 
it's essential that they be supported through socio-political institutions and organizational practices at the local level of citizenship. We have furnished the model of relational citizenship with a human rights ontology that recognizes these pre-reflective dimensions of agency as fundamental to being human and thereby necessitates that we cultivate a relational environment that supports these dimensions to the fullest extent possible. In this sense, the relational model of citizenship frames the argument for actualizing the rights to this support on the basis of being human and not on the basis of individuals formal membership in a nation state. The appeal of using human rights to furnish the ontological foundation for citizenship is that citizenship claims have purchase only in the context of a particular socio-political body. Human rights, by contrast, transcend political and or social boundaries by virtue of their universality. Human rights are premised on, on, on fundamental principles such as universality, equality, and non-discrimination, security, and dignity. Citizenship and human rights are compatible in that citizenship allows for the local realization of human rights through socio-political institutions and organizational practices at the local level of citizenship. So to this end, the model of relational citizenship is particularly pertinent for supporting the rights of persons living with dementia, because in the face of cognitive impairment, embodied self-expression becomes the primary means of engaging with the world. Such expressions are not typically valorized within traditional models of citizenship that pr prioritize self-sovereignty and public forms of engagement and are consequently not publicly supported through institutional policies, structures, and practices. So I turn now to two research studies that will help me to illustrate the importance of the relational model of citizenship for understanding the creativity of persons living with dementia while also addressing broader issues of their inclusivity and the multi-scalar support of their engagement with the arts. These will allow me to address critical links between embodiment, citizenship, relationality, and the arts. The first study was a mixed methods evaluation of a 12-week elder clown program. And for those of you who are not familiar with this art form, since the late 19th 90s, clowning has been adapted for specific use with the dementia population. Elder clowns avoid the traditional heavily made up white faced clown with the exaggerated smile and oversized shoes. Elder clowns instead keep their faces natural with minimal makeup and wear clothing that evokes an earlier era such as 1950s swing dresses. Elder clowns rely upon information provided by healthcare staff and family members to tailor interactions to residents' life histories, which includes clinical, social, and familial details. What's also distinctively clown about elder clowns is that they don a red nose and they use verbal, physical, and musical interactions that incorporate fantasy, surprise, dramatic movement, physical comedy, storytelling, and magic. They use body language ranging from muscular, uh, subtle muscular movements of the face to more obvious gestural movements of the body. Within the context of advanced dementia, where verbal communication is often limited and maybe non-existent, clowning utilizes physically oriented question and answer tactics, such as eye contact, smiling, short actions, and slow movements. The context for this study was a dementia care unit of a nursing home in urban central Canada. Four elder clowns were hired for the study. They had been professionally trained at, at recognized Canadian clown organizations, and 23 residents participated in the study. So in this study, the primary objective was to explore the techniques and strategies the elder clowns used when interacting with the residents. And what, the, and, and what the residents themselves brought to those interactions. To facilitate analysis, 66 hours of video recorded clown resident interactions were collected. And our interest here was to examine how relational citizenship might be supported at the micro level of care practices. 
And my focus here for the purposes of, of, um, of this presentation is two interactions involving three elder clowns and two resident participants, each of which highlights the situated, embodied and relational nature of creativity in the context of advanced dementia. Both interactions were transcribed as non-participant observer field notes. Field notes detail clown techniques, residents' nonverbal, social, and affective expressions, their verbal exchanges, and emotive responses. And when required, interactions were repeatedly reviewed in slow motion in order to focus on nonverbal micro features of the interactions. Pseudonyms have been assigned to resident participants, Bridget and Frank, and the elder clowns, Zazie, Mitzi, and Cherry. Bridget was 84 years of age at the time of the study. She was born in Ireland and would express great pride about her Irish heritage. She was a homemaker who loved to entertain. She always liked the glamour of Hollywood and the movies and would emulate this in her, in her own style of dress and makeup. Zazie and Cherry knock on the door to Bridget's room. Zazie is wearing a nautical inspired outfit, blue fitted top that flares out at the waist and buttons down the front. This is paired with a matching blue pencil skirt. Both her top and bottom have white trim. She's wearing a pearl necklace, a thin red belt, and, red and, and a red and black polka dot hat. And she's carrying a red ukulele. Cherry is in a light pink floral pattern 1950s style swing dress with crinoline. Cherry has on a thin white belt and a large beaded, uh, large beaded necklace and her hair is pulled back with a matching pink ribbon tied in a bow. And both are wearing their red sponge nose. Come in is heard from the room in response. Yet when they enter, they find no one in the room. Zazie and Cherry look around the room calling out in a sing-song voice, oh, hello, Bridget. At that very moment, Bridget walks out of the ensuite washroom accompanied by her private care who's holding her hand. Bridget looks at the elder clowns and with great surprise and delight with her attention, the elder clowns wildly wave their arms and giggle with excitement and exclaim, ooh. As if taken aback by their excitement, Bridget clutches her chest and grins widely. Then in a soft but deliberate gesture, Bridget extends her right hand out in front of her body and her arm follows in a sweeping movement out to her right side, as if presenting herself to the elder clowns. With this gesture, Bridget commences a rendition of the song, When Irish Eyes Are Smiling. The elder clowns sway their bodies to her song and join in singing. Bridget is, Bridget is very expressive as she sings using an imaginary baton, lifting her shoulders and extending her arms, closing her eyes and using musical dynamics like crescendos and decrescendos. The elder clowns singing is perfectly matched to Bridget's tempo as are their bodily gestures of musicality. As Bridget finishes the song, she smiles and nervously adjusts the bottom of her shirt. The elder clowns erupt in enthusiastic applause and holler, bravo! Bridget smiles shyly as she looks at the elder clowns and with reserved pride joins their applause, softly clapping her hands. Frank was 91 years of age at the time of the study. He was born in Poland and worked as a delicatessen owner his whole working life. He was highly sociable. He particularly enjoyed singing along to music and would dance at every opportunity. Zazie and Cherry knock on the door to Frank's room. Zazie is wearing her usual blue nautical inspired outfit and Cherry is also in her usual 1950 swing dress with crinoline. Both are wearing their red sponge nose. Frank, who's seated in an armchair with his four-wheeled walker placed in front of him, says, come in. Both Zazie and Cherry say, ooh, startled by Frank's quick response, but eagerly enter the room. As they enter the room, Frank is leaning forward in his chair in anticipation of their arrival. He lifts both his arms up in the air as the elder clowns approach him with an excited, hello. Frank extends both his arms out towards the elder clowns, and when they reciprocate the gesture, Frank leans forward and uses the arms of the chair to stand. Once he's standing, he extends his hands out towards the elder clowns. 
Zazi, who's standing in front of Frank to his right, grasps his right hand with her left hand. And Cherry, who's standing in front of Frank to his left, grasps his left hand with her right hand and says, hello, hello. And Frank says, hi, hi. Still holding the elder clown's hands, Frank starts bouncing their clasped hands up and down, which the elder clowns interpret as a desire to dance. Zazie immediately starts humming a made up tune and Cherry and Frank both join in the humming. With a huge smile on his face, Frank continues to hold the elder clown's hands, but instead of the bouncing movement, he swings their clasped hands from side to side. He also shifts his weight from left to right, slightly bending his knees as he bounces along to the a cappella music. The elder clowns follow Frank's lead, distance, dis, uh, friends, sorry, follow Frank's lead, dancing from side to side. Frank then lifts their clasped hands high above his head and holds them there, which signals to both Zazie and Cherry to do a lady's underarm turn, which they do simultaneously, each under one of his arms. As they do so, they both exclaim, woo! Still smiling, Frank lifts his arms again to signal for them to do another underarm turn, which they do with an even more exaggerated woo! With their hands still clasped with Frank's and doing step touches in unison, Cherry says to Frank, you are an excellent dancer, sir. Frank proudly agrees by saying, yeah, with a full smile as he continues to dance with the elder clowns. So I turn now to the second research study, which was an ethnographic study of an Orthodox Jewish long-term care home, specifically one of the units that provides care for residents living with dementia. All of the residents were Jewish of Eastern European descent. And our analysis focus on, focuses on a series of interactions during religious social programs in the home. Jewishness is a vital integral part of the daily life at this home. There are two rabbis on staff, daily synagogue services are offered on site, a facility wide kosher food policy is in place, and there are Sabbath and other holiday observances. The following two field notes capture the enactment of different ancient ritual gestures related to the holidays of Simcha Torah and Hanukkah. Each ritual involves certain symbols that pertain to the Jewish home and family, as well as customs that are enacted and are thus profoundly um, corporeal experiences. Synagogue services are well attended, a porter, social, uh, personal support worker, or family member will escort residents and services are led by a rabbi. The major ritual associated with Hanukkah is the lighting of the menorah. The menorah is lit each night of Hanukkah after sundown with the shamash, which is the candle that's used for lighting the other candles, which is placed higher on the menorah to differentiate it from the others. One candle is added each night until all eight candles, well nine, including the shamash, are lit on the last night of Hanukkah. The last day of Hanukkah is considered to have special significance as the culmination of the holiday, the day when the menorah burns most brightly. It's on the eighth and final day of this religious occasion that a concert and party are arranged for the residents in the recreation room. A ceremonial lighting of the menorah is part of the celebration, and the following observation is of Dora during a Hanukkah celebration that powerfully captures her love of dance, requiring neither a partner nor even to stand from her wheelchair. The concert began with piano and a strong alto voice filling the room with Yiddish song. As I stood listening and watching, I noticed Dora. Somehow sitting in her wheelchair, Dora was dancing. She created a sense of fluidity and abandon with the elegant movement of her arms above her head and the delicate wiggling of her fingers while slowly lowering her hands to each side of the, of the wheelchair. Dramatically tossing her head back, she extended her arms above her head in the style of an arabesque. So choreographed was her dance that I wondered if she was reenacting a performance from another time. When the song finished, applause erupted in appreciation for the singer and pianist, and Dora moved her upper body forward in her chair as if to take a bow for her own performance. 
Jelly donuts brought out by staff and volunteers were served to the residents on plastic plates with a napkin. Dora ate her donut as she continued to listen to the music. With her hands busy with the donut, she struggled to stretch her legs out in front of her. Her swollen feet looked almost delicate as she gently brought her toes together and then her heels together, alternating the, these movements to the rhythm of the music. Simcha Torah is one of the most widely celebrated rituals of the Jewish faith. It's the day of celebration of the gift of Torah, the five books of Moses. The following observation illustrates the enactment of an ancient ritual gesture related to the holiday of Simcha Torah. On Simcha Torah, the synagogue at the facility rang out powerfully in him. My attention was drawn to the center of the synagogue where the men prayed with intensity and passion. Among the participants stood Jacob. Jacob would often chastise residents who, because of their dementia, were disruptive. Ironically, his own advanced dementia had limited his verbal expression to the use of single words. Yet Jacob moved his lips with the service leader's chance. I watched as he swayed deeply, stepping forward and back, bowing and striking his chest with clenched fists as is commonly done in Jewish prayer. He was energetic and forceful in his fervent bodily movement of prayer. The leader held a Torah scroll and circled the interior of the synagogue, followed by honored members of the congregation who held the other scrolls. After the procession of Torah bearers circled the synagogue, the leader broke out in joyous song and all the congregation joined in singing and dancing. In the center of the synagogue, the men formed a circle and danced around those who held a Torah scroll. Jacob joined in the pounding dances. He threw his body completely into rejoicing with the Torah, twisting his shoulders and hips and snapping his fingers in the air. The relational model of citizenship importantly broadens understandings of creativity by foregrounding how capacities and senses of the body are central to creativity in everyday life for persons living with dementia. It specifically holds that embodied intentionality, which is itself inherently pre-reflective and relational, is a generative and creative capacity to perceive and engage with the world. The pre-reflective nature of embodied intentionality refers to existential or practical competence that does not require reflective understanding. To illustrate that embodied intentionality is key to understanding creativity in the context of dementia, I draw on the key theoretical tenets of the relational model of citizenship, embodied selfhood, specifically the primordial and sociocultural dispositions of the body that are sources of self-expression and relationality. And I begin by attending to the sociocultural style or content of Frank's and Bridget's creativity, given how embodiment and the sociocultural are co-implicated. Take, for example, how Frank seamlessly led the elder clowns into a lady's underarm turn, what is typical of the European style of social partner dancing. Thinking of this dance in terms of Barbara Meyerhoff's analysis of ritual practice is instructive as it helps us to see the, the, um, how the past returns with the ritual movements, gestures, and recapitulations all of, uh, of which evoked, are evoked through the senses, linking the individual to associations and feelings of previous times. For Frank, partner dancing is the active presence of his past, what Bourdieu would describe as embodied history, internalized as a second nature and so forgotten as history. It was the presence of the elder clowns, their formal and party dress attire, the touch of their clasped hands and the sounds of humming which were all aspects of an interaction that exercised the pertinent incitement of Frank's sociocultural dispositions, which are fund a fundamental source of his embodied intentionality and hence his creativity. We can similarly see with Bridget's spontaneous musical rendition of When Irish Eyes Are Smiling, that the presence of the elder clowns and their attire incited her sociocultural dispositions associated with her Irish heritage and her practice of socializing and entertaining guests. Her chosen song is a culturally distinct style 
of music, often formally or spontaneously performed without musical accompaniment, and thus is consistent with what would have been socially and culturally distinct experiences of hers. As with Frank, Bridget's socially and culturally distinct dimensions of musicality are manifest despite her cognition, her impaired cognition, because of how sociocultural dispositions are regulated, not by conscious obeisance to external rules, but by the pre-reflective nature of embodied intentionality. Jacob's performance similarly illustrates how embodiment and enculturation are co-implicated. The emotion that's expressed by Eastern European Jews in gesture and speech is similarly expressed in prayer through dance and bodily movement. In Jewish faith, gestures and movements are essential ingredients in the life of prayer, enabling the worshipers to put the whole of themselves into the act of worship. In Sim on Simcha Torah, as, as Jacob prayed and swayed deeply, stepping forward and back, bowing and striking his chest with clenched fists, a kind of dance reflecting an intense and, and vital bodily force that's so common in Jewish prayer. Thus, Jewish heritage was fundamentally influential in that ritual aroused deep memories. Those surges of remembrance are not merely accurate and extensive, but bring with them the essences and textures of their original context, transcending time and even dementia. Reenacting rituals were part, that were part of one's early childhood is not a matter of delving into the past through a cognitive operation, Rituals carry a potent emotion and cultural rootedness that's embodied. The presence of the rabbi and congregants, the touch of the Torah, the scent of burning candles, and the sanctuary all offered a dynamic field of sensual mutuality that intersected with Jacob's embodied selfhood, thereby eliciting the dispositions necessary for his expression through dance. We can see that with Dora too, her dance was connected with the ritual of the Jewish faith, one that carries with it a joyous sentiment that was reflected in the fluidity and abandon with the movements of her arms, the wiggling of her fingers, and the playfulness in how she brought together her toes and her heels in an alternating pattern. There was a congruence between her movements and the celebratory nature of the occasion. We can say that it was her embodied selfhood that harmonized her dance, and that her knowledge of the movements was pre-reflective and activated only when evoked in practice. To be even more precise, it's a practical reactivation, whereby the knowledge that the body reproduces is not a memorization of the past, but rather an enactment of the past. In this sense, Dora's dance discloses a kind of mastery in the form of transposable dispositions that collectively function as a matrix of perceptions and actions, which are acquired as part of primary learning and reinforced through socialization within a Jewish home and implemented only by way of immersion within a practical state. Yet the sociocultural dispositions evident in Frank's, Bridget's, Jacob's and Dora's expressions of creativity are but half the picture since the primordial structure of the body not only facilitates the embodiment of the socio-cultural dispositions, but also sustains them on an ongoing basis. In this sense, while Frank's and Bridget's creativity is shaped by their socio-cultural history, it's also sustained by the primordial structure of bodies themselves. The primordial refers to a fundamental attunement to the body of, um, of the body to the world, which is a kind of knowing that derives from the body's natural investment with perceptual significance, a bodily know-how or practical sense. This form of know-how functions below the threshold of cognition and is enacted in practical sense at a pre-reflective level. In this rethinking of perception, gestures and actions are not related um, to intention by way of being a representation of them that's externally linked, but rather intention is imminent in the gestures and actions themselves, impelling and sustaining them at every moment. Because dominant narratives of creativity are premised on cognition, there is a seeming contradiction between Frank's, Bridget's, Jacob's and Dora's creativity and the fact of their cognitive impairment. 
Yet, as we've argued, the relational model of citizenship introduces a pre-reflective account of embodied intentionality that offers a compelling alternative to dominant understandings of creativity in the context of dementia. Franks and Bridges' performances were not an intellectual effort of meditation and contemplation, nor did they derive from rules, principles, or calculations, or a premeditated goal, which would in any case be excluded by the improvisational nature of their performances. And in both cases, reflective thought and calculation would be further excluded by the fact of their advanced dementia. Neither could their movements be mistaken for pure imitation, particularly if we consider that in all four examples, the participants led aspects of the creative self-expression. That Frank and Bridget took a lead position is not to diminish the importance of all that the elder clowns brought to these interactions. Common strategies that the elder clowns used in their interactions with residents included authentic presence, sensitivity, and susceptibility to becoming affected by the expressions and sentiments of residents. And the improvisation technique of yes and, which entails accepting an offer and adding something to it and giving it back. With these strategies, they fostered a, corpor a corporeal ethical space that supported Franks and Bridget's spontaneous and creative engagement within the context of their everyday life. Jacobs and Dora's, Dora's creativity can similarly be seen to have emerged from a corporeal ethical space, a religious holiday with corresponding rituals orchestrated at the home created a meaningful connection with their selfhood a connection that triggered their specific actions. So, so the resulting creativity in all of these examples can only be understood with reference to the complex intersection of enabling environments and the embodied intentionality of all involved. Our analysis importantly responds to a call for the development of a broader view of creativity to account for the everyday and ordinary creativity of regular citizens including persons living with dementia. The importance of broadening conventional narratives of creativity in this way is that it provides a more inclusive view of creative practices that might not have an enduring legacy, but are nonetheless meaningful in the context of everyday lives. So very quickly, just finishing up here, the implication of our, our Bauer analysis is that the body as a source of agency is not only fundamental to creativity, but also must be recognized as fundamental to the human condition. And as such, it's imperative that all forms of creativity be supported through a matrix of human rights, such as freedom of expression and human dignity, and that it be supported through organizational practices and socio-political institutions. This entails the mobilization of structures and resources um, to nurture and facilitate the creativity of persons living with dementia for life enrichment, rather than as a form of maintenance entertainment with the aim to keep people happy and offering little creative challenge. And so <clears throat> this will also require shifting the culture of dementia care by fostering the relational skills and creative practices of all care providers so that creativity becomes part of the moral fabric of everyday life in long-term residential care settings. So introducing educational in initiatives for providers to raise their awareness about the nature and extent of creativity and dementia and to provide for them opportunities to engage creatively in practice development will be crucial to achieve this. And finally, practice development of this nature needs to happen in tandem with broader structural changes um, that more fully support the relational, interpersonal and effective dimensions of care. And these include, but are not limited to reducing providers' workloads, increasing provider to resident ratios, and increasing their decision-making autonomy um, to allow them to more fully support residents' needs and capacities and desires. So I see that I'm, I'm just past the 50 minute mark. So I, I'm gonna stop there and um, look forward to all of your comments and questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Pierre, for that great and a very insightful presentation. Um, I know that uh, one of our PhD students, uh, Pierre de Mio, is going to lead the question and answer session. Thanks, Gavin. And thank you, Pierre, so much. That was really great. Um, I was really looking forward to this talk and it certainly dis didn't disappoint, I'm sure.
others feel the same way. And uh, I'm sure you can imagine perhaps a chorus of applause here because if people were to actually unmute and do that, I don't think it would sound nearly as good as it does in person. But uh, I hope you'll accept uh, my thanks on behalf of everyone else here. Um, so going forward with questions, if anyone has a question, uh, please feel free to type it in chat if you'd like it, uh, us to read it out, or perhaps if you just want to unmute and ask the question, um, that's fine as well. If there are a lot of questions, just please uh, also note in, in chat that you would like to, to speak in turn and we'll, we'll queue you up. So feel free to post or unmute at any time if you have any questions for Pia. I know it was a lot of information that I packed in there, so it may take some time to process, but I'm, I'm certainly open to being contacted later um, should questions arise then as well. Hi. So, um, so uh, Pujan Joshi um, writes, how can we translate this knowledge to different cultures and with more informal caregivers? So uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in terms of, I, I think, I, I, I hope it's clear that the theoretical framework provides um, a way to, um, to guide explorations with other cultures and in other settings. Um, and so this, what I've presented here, certainly wasn't intended to be exhaustive. And, and I would hope that this inspires um, others to, to take this up um, in, with other populations and, and um, in other settings. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question in terms of translation, um, meaning in practice or how theoretically this might be uh, applied in other settings and with other populations. So maybe maybe just some clarification. But I mean, clearly, we, we, we've, we've used this model to explore um, creativity um, in, in, in very particular settings. Um, and I think it's ripe uh, for analysis of, of other um, you know, of creativity um, within other populations, for sure. Yep, uh, Pujan just confirmed that yes, that did answer the question. And oh. thank you very much. Great. Looks like Gavin has a question. Gav yeah, Gavin. Got your head up. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah. So I was re. I I was thinking how your theory and, and and what you're talking about really does speak to the subject matter, but it really presses outwards for me, right? So you were talking. You talk a lot about the world, and so for me, a lot of the insights you provide uh, between about the relationships between older people and the world require sort of maybe a rereading of the world as much as they do of concepts like citizenship or creativity. You know, so for me, questions were coming on in my head like, you know, what is the world for older people? What is an aging life world? How are older people part of that world? Or is in this, in this context, you know, the, the idea of world just kind of an, in an everyday term, is, is, is it an everyday term? Is it sort of just mood lighting, if you like? Um, or could we rethink the idea of world given these insights? Hmm. That's really interesting, um, Gavin. I think that that I've I've thought about the world always because I do empirical research in addition to the theoretical work. I think about the world in terms of the particular settings in which I'm exploring these ideas. So the world is a dementia care unit, and 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 the, the, the people, the objects, um, you know, the space um, is what comprises the world, I think, for, for those folks. But I could see how different that would be if you move to a community 
um, based setting. So, so absolutely, I think that um, I would hope that this perspective draws attention to the importance of that world, whatever that might entail, because we need to create spaces um, that are much more supportive of this kind of, of creative self-expression. So we need to be attentive to, to, to um, the construction of those spaces and how we can make them more supportive. Great. And Pia, I know that uh, that your your timing is tight here. Do you have time for one more, or shall we uh, oh, ask the folks email you? I no, I can absolutely stay on. Okay, great. Um, so we have another question from uh, Shelley King, and they write: How can your research findings be used to encourage long-term care homes to incorporate this type of creativity programming into their budgets, staff training, and daily schedules? Great question. Um, and something that I am very much committed to because I do see the importance of um, incorporating the arts into all aspects of living um, in long-term care settings. Um, and so I, I, I think a big part of this is shifting the culture because um, the arts have been adopted within um, the medical model that dominates, med uh, that dominates dementia care. And so it's so how, how do we shift that culture to help um, you know, managers, administrators, healthcare practitioners see the value of the arts to support life enrichment? So I see this as, as part of the culture change work that, um, that I've been doing and others have been doing. Um, and, I, and I think that using the sort of empirical work like the work that I've presented here can really help to, um, to, af to affect that shift because I think seeing the enormous potential that the arts have to support um, the humanity of people living with dementia can help to challenge assumptions that they lack that capacity to express themselves in those ways. So that's part of this, it's stigma. And, and so encouraging long-term care homes to adopt um, you know, the arts in this much broader and more inclusive way is about challenging stigma, is about raising awareness about the capacity of people living with dementia to express themselves. Um, and, and, and I think raising the bar, you know, really challenging the creative spirit of people living with dementia um, and helping, helping folks to see that that's not only possible, but um, I think there's a moral imperative to do so, given that this is a fundamental way that, that they can connect to the world. So it's part of the culture change work. Um, and I think it's, it's largely, um, it boils down to challenging stigma, and, which is, a, which is a, a first step. And then of course, um, you know, uh, getting the resources um, in place to support this. But I think the first step is stigma to moving people to to a place where they even see um the broader possibilities here thank you very much and are there any other questions also feel free to unmute if you'd like to speak your question orally I'll just pass on a, a comment from, from Shelley King and, and follow up to your response, which is, uh, we have our work cut out for us. Thank you for your, all that you're doing. Yeah, we, we, we absolutely do. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's also why I've, I've used it. To, I, I couldn't bring, pull, pull it into this presentation because it would have been too much. But um, in terms of the education that I alluded to at the end of the presentation, I think using the arts to challenge um, stigma, to challenge dominant assumptions about um, uh, dementia, I think using the arts to do that has enormous potential. And so I use theater a lot in my work for that reason. Um, so yes, it, it, there's lots of work to do and challenging the way people think about dementia and the way that they relate to people living with dementia is, is, is not easy. Um, and so I think that um, 
I think all the more reason then that using the arts as a novel way to engage um, is absolutely critical. And I refer to that work as arts for social justice versus the work I've presented here, which is the arts for life enrichment. As we uh, wait for more questions, I'll just mention that both the Gilbrea Center for Studies in Aging annual seminar series and the Has Talk seminar series hosted by the Department of Health, Aging and Society have more upcoming talks and we'll be posting links um, for those uh, future top topics on the schedule as well. Indeed, I'll just follow up there. I know that we have a, uh, a Gilbrea seminar on the uh, 24th of November. I think the next Hass talk is on November the 18th, isn't it? Yes, the, uh, the 18th. And I believe that info has been posted in the chat. There are some links there um, to view the schedules. So I'd like to, to uh, again, thank Pierre for a wonderful presentation. And just so you know, Pierre, because you may not have been, while you were presenting, may not have been aware but I did count over 35 uh, viewers at one point. I think we might have had as many as 40. Uh, so there was lots of people watching because of course you can probably only see four or five people, uh, but there was a, a that, that's a, 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 a very good attendance. Uh, uh, and of course there'll be other people that'll watch it later on as we post it in, in, in our uh, YouTube uh, 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 posting. So thank you very much, Pia. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, everybody, if you have any further questions, as Pierre said, she would be more than happy to, for you to email her uh, and to ask her directly. Uh, thank you. Anything you would like to add? Just want to say thank you again um, for, for including me in the series. Um, and if there are any resources um, that I can share, if I've mentioned anything that anyone has an interest in following up on, I'm, by all means, I'm, I'm happy to engage. I, I welcome the interest. So thank you. Uh, anything to add, Pete? Pete? Oh, sorry, equity before we uh, log off there. Anything to add that I've forgotten maybe? No, I don't think so. I think that is all. Thank you so oh, much, Pia. This is wonderful. And we'll be recording this. This has been recording and we will upload to our YouTube channel um, probably within the next two weeks. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good bye -bye. day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.